mean, without constraints, just to give you an idea, uh, and, and then uh, with uh, different types of uh, restraints. And uh, different strategies for reducing uh, project durations are what to do in cases where we have to accelerate projects, where we have to squeeze the time uh, very often. Projects face different types of risk. The uh, vital time is wasted because of waiting for supplies or because of unforeseen e events. So what are uh, different strategies that could be used uh, under those circumstances? So that's a, a sort of an outline uh, journey of a uh, project uh, planning and scheduling uh, which uh, we are taking. So. So starting. Uh, with uh, uh, the basic uh, the activities that take place in the start of a project, so listing all project key activities, and then moving on to uh, develop network diagrams or a precedence diagram, which basically helps us uh, identify the logical relationships between different activities uh, and their preceding uh, precedence relationships. Once that is done, we do a forward path and a backward path calculations. Forward path helps us calculate the early start times and the backward path helps us calculate the late start times. The knowledge of early start time and late start times is critical when we are planning uh, our resources and in particular when we are planning for projects uh, under constrained environments. <clears throat> this information is later on converted into uh, Gantt charts uh, uh, or bar charts, moving on to uh, resource planning and uh, cost planning and uh, monitoring. So we did uh, uh, address some of these issues uh, previously, but that serves as a quick recap before uh, we build on uh, to this. So uh, key uh, steps in uh, scheduling. So we very often start with our client trying to understand the client requirements and uh, uh, trying to identify what is the key, uh, work breakdown structure so very much like an organizational structure we uh, usually create a sort of a work breakdown structure to develop a clear understanding of uh, the key work packages and their uh, relationships then we identify the activities and put those activities in a logical relationship to develop uh, preceding diagrams. So even though we have covered this, but uh, just a quick recap uh, of a previous discussion. So we start usually with a sort of a method statements or a client requirements of a project. So here the uh, method statement was the site must first be cleared and prepared for construction. So that's the very first activity in the project site preparation. Once the site is ready, the utility services can be installed and connected to the existing. So that's the second key work package and its relationship with the previous work package was uh, finished to start. And uh, following on the foundation of the apartment building then can be formed and poured. Uh, so moving uh, on. So we uh, try to convert uh, a logical description of uh, various tasks into a network diagram, basically uh, indicating uh, the relationships. And uh, we did learn that there are different types of relationship between different tasks within a network diagram. So uh, the finish to start and start to start is shown here. And there are two other types of relationships which we will quickly cover today. So uh, network diagrams uh, uh, are become, uh, as project becomes larger, more complex, and uh, Gantt charts uh, as found to be lacking. And network diagram is a quick uh, uh, visual way to explain logical relationship between uh, different uh, work packages. It has been used extensively across different uh, industry sectors, and it's uh, a, a good visual communication tools. Uh, and it, it was developed in the form of a BERT um, program evaluation and review technique and CPM, the format of the network diagram presented activities in boxes and the sequence of the activities from left to right to show the logic of the project. So all the modern day software uh, do support and uh, development of the network uh, and diagram. Now, this is again a recap uh, just to rejog your memories. Uh, and because uh, uh, resource management and resource planning builds on um, uh, having a good grasp of a critical uh, path method. So we just discussed uh, this example of uh, developing uh, 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 sort of a, a, a car parking uh, lot. 
uh, and uh, these were the preceding activities. So here you can see the first thing is the first activity is survey, which is the very first activity taking place in the project. Uh, so um, uh, followed by three other activities, uh, which are all merging into activity uh, E. As you can see, the E has got a preceding relationship of B, C, and D. So we learn how to uh, transfer this information into a network diagram following this logic. So here, a is the starting activity followed by B, C, D, and then E is a sort of a converging activity. And from then E, uh, four activities are splitting out and activity J. Now we did uh, learn uh, how to do a forward pass and a backward pass calculation. So it's very simple. You need to know the duration and you basically start your project from day zero. If you are manually planning a project and it is the current day or any other specified day if you are using a software tool for uh, planning your project. So starting from zero to five, uh, the duration in this way, you calculate the early start time and the uh, early finish time for different activities. And in the backward pass, uh, we uh, calculate the late finish times uh, and the uh, late start time for different activities. And the two rules of thumb while doing these calculations we remembered was that while doing a forward pass in case of a merge activity in a case like this we always choose the largest of the value and this would reverse uh, the logic would be reverse if we are doing a backward pass so in case of a backward pass when we are coming uh, from the uh, bottom layer uh, we will be choosing the smallest of the value so here in this case 115 is the smallest of the four values and which is chosen here uh, for activity e so this way we learn how to uh, develop a network diagram do a forward pass backward pass and then uh, use this information to identify the critical path which is basically a path with zero slack so uh, here uh, the path running almost to the uh, middle of the project uh, is the uh, critical path because uh, you can see all the activities have a zero slack whereas other activities have got some float so this knowledge of float or slack becomes very important when we manage projects uh, under different uh, constrained environments so uh, Determining the relationship between uh, different uh, activities uh, is a key task. Once the sequence has been established, you need to determine the direct relationship between each activity. But how does sequencing differ from identifying the relationship of task and activity? Uh, so essentially, in terms of a sequencing, there are four different types of sequencing that you need to be familiar with. Finish to start and uh, start to start are the two ones which we just saw in the previous example. The other two most common uh, are the finish to finish and start to finish. So the finish to start is a most common type of dependency. The successor task cannot start until the predecessor task finishes. An example of finish to start relationships would include things like you must write or submit your coursework before I can mark it. So your uh, submission must become finished before uh, the marking process will begin. So an example of finish to start, you must buy the computer first before you can install any software on it so purchase of computer is the first task and followed by the uh, following task or once courseworks have been submitted there will be a time lag of 14 days prior to results being announced so here the coursework submission would be one task followed by announcement of results with a time lag of 14 days so uh, this is a sort of a, a Notation, but I think it, it should be, uh, it is indicating a finish to finish here. Uh, if it's a finish to start, the, uh, the arrow should uh, lead from finish of the preceding activity to the, so this is, um, I think, a wrong example in this case. The uh, second uh, type of a relationship uh, is a start to start. The successor cannot start until the predecessor starts. And uh, as soon as you start getting the bricks on the site, you can start the work. You do not need to finish for all the bricks to be delivered. So this is a way to encourage some, encourage some sort of a concurrent work uh, and a strategy to save the time. Uh, so in uh, while doing the calculations for these sort of a relationships, uh, only consideration should be that and this lag has to be taken into account. So here you can see an example of a finish to start. So activity B is starting after a lag of five. So activity B should start after two at five, which is uh, seven. 
and uh, then uh, activity B would finish uh, seven at the duration of the activity, which is four, uh, 11 week. And here you can see the relationship between B and C is that of a start to start. So uh, uh, activity C would be starting from seven uh, at a lag of three, uh, which is 10 and, uh, and so on and so forth. The other type of a relationship that uh, you need to be familiar with is a start to finish. The successor task cannot finish until the predecessor uh, task starts. Uh, workers can start work on the site only once they have uh, finished their uh, induction uh, uh, training. You must not start work on the roof until delivery of material has been uh, completed. Uh, so an example of a, a start to uh, a finish and the last type of a relationship is a finish to finish dependency the success task cannot finish until the predecessor task finish uh, examples would be refurbishment work on two rooms in the maxwell building must finish on the 15th of march so that students can attend the class next day uh, or paint work cannot be finished until you finish acquiring uh, material. So uh, in most of the uh, planning work, finish to uh, uh, start and uh, uh, start to uh, start are the most common types, but these are two other types of relationship which, uh, which is important to be familiar with. So some uh, uh, practice uh, for you to uh, take into account these sort of relationships and calculations. So here, uh, starting the project on day zero and it should be done by day two given the duration so the subsequent activity would start from day two uh, moving to four and uh, in the case of c uh, uh, the activity c has a duration of uh, six so most of it is simple but i would highlight the relationship uh, between uh, c and the uh, and it has got a start to finish relationship so uh, it basically suggesting that uh, even though activity D could start uh, after day four, but it would be uh, finishing uh, uh, given the logic suggested by this so two add seven uh, nine. Uh, and uh, uh, likewise, the activity F would be uh, nine add three uh, twelve. So e even though the start will be uh, uh, approaching from this direction uh, six uh, nine and uh, nine but and because of a constraint uh, introduced here the finish would be slightly different so we need to be familiar with uh, these sort of uh, calculations so as i said the good news is that uh, very often we do not have to do all of these calculations manually because uh, um, a lot of project uh, management software do these uh, things <clears throat> behind the scene now, when we talk about scheduling, uh, there are two uh, types of uh, scheduling that we need to be familiar with. The one is called deterministic and uh, the other one is called probabilistic. So very often uh, there are situations where uh, you are 100 percent absolutely clear that doing a particular job will take certain specified amount of time. This is where you would be using uh, deterministic scheduling. Uh, where you are not 100% uh, sure and all you are given is this probability of uh, uh, optimistic uh, uh, or and the most likely time uh, you, you would be making use of probabilistic scheduling uh, which is often referred to as a BERT or a program evaluation and uh, review techniques it uses the distribution mean to determine individual activity duration and it uses uh, this formula so very often uh, in an environment like construction, it is very diff difficult to have uh, an idea of a very precise uh, cast in stone times. So very often the contractors will give you a time bracket where they will tell you that in an ideal situation, if the weather is fine and if the conditions are perfect, that is the optimistic time. It could be seven weeks, but if things are not delivered on time or if the weather is inclement, uh, then you could have a 12 weeks duration. So you are basically given a, a, a sort of a, a time scale. So we will uh, just quickly review uh, on how to schedule in terms of uh, uh, where you have got definite deterministic times and where you have got uh, probabilistic times. Uh, 
So in the, in the examples which we have seen uh, so far, we have made use of the deterministic approach. So a critical path method uses a deterministic approach which suits a project uh, where time and duration can be accurately predicted. Again, CPM could make use of a probabilistic time as well, but uh, in the example so far which we have done, we have made use of uh, uh, deterministic times. Uh, CPM was initially set up to address the time cost trade-off dilemma often presented to project managers where there is a complex relationship between project time to complete and uh, cost to complete. If the project duration is shortened, how will uh, this affect the uh, cost? So we did talk about the golden triangle, cost, quality and time uh, objectives and the sort of a compromises which uh, have to be achieved uh, uh, across all dimensions. So in large complex projects, CPM can be useful to work out the overall effect of the changes. So we see an example of uh, deterministic scheduling. So it, this is an example of a project where we have been given uh, clear times by the contractors. So here you can see very clearly uh, given site duration was it's going to take eight weeks and this is the starting activity substructures is taking 12 weeks uh, and, and it has got a preceding relationship a, so the activity A, which is site preparation, must be complete. So, and the relationship between activity B and A is that of finish to start. Uh, activity C is following the superstructure. So, very much uh, like the preceding examples. Uh, so. Uh, uh, which uh, we uh, saw. So uh, converting this uh, into uh, a deterministic uh, schedule, uh, again, using the similar sort of an approach, uh, we start, so we have got uh, all the deterministic times and uh, we will do the forward path and the backward path to calculate uh, uh, the uh, overall duration of our project, which in this case is 52 weeks, and the critical path, which is uh, shown in the uh, red here, and the float of different activities. So, so far so clear. Uh, deterministic uh, uh, times are much easier to operate, but very often uh, this is not the case. When you talk to contractors, they tend to uh, avoid giving uh, deterministic times because that put them on the line in case if they could not deliver it uh, as promised. So here the uh, method statement or the requirements capture uh, is uh, given. The general contractor believes that it will take eight weeks to complete the site preparation, give or take three weeks uh, because there are a number of different variables involved uh, and uh, the general contractor cannot be certain, so they have given you a time bracket here, uh, which is uh, eight weeks, but it could be in a worst case scenario, 11 weeks, or uh, it could be five weeks in if all the conditions are met. And then the substructure can be finished in uh, 12 weeks, uh, and give or take uh, four weeks. So we, uh, we uh, convert this information, uh, which is given in terms of time brackets with uh, um, optimistic uh, and pessimistic times uh, and uh, use here. So if we have to look at the first activity, uh, uh, which is uh, the site preparation. So we will uh, start by looking at it. This, uh, it will take five, eight weeks to complete and give, give or take three weeks. So here you can see the optimistic preparation uh, and duration which is given for the site preparation is five weeks. Uh, the uh, most likely duration is eight weeks and the pessimistic duration is uh, 11 weeks. So using this formula, uh, which is A uh, plus 4M uh, plus B slash C, you will calculate the expected uh, activity duration. So if you do a quick uh, calculation, so this will be five, add 32, uh, add uh, 11. All right, so let me use my pencil, five and 32 and 11, and that would be uh, 48 divided by six, which would mean that the expected activity duration is going to be eight weeks, and the standard deviation for this activity, which is used by the calculations, is D minus A, uh, six divided by, uh, so in this case, the standard deviation is uh, one. 
Right. So there are uh, purpose-built uh, tools uh, such as a Simeo scheduler and also um, uh, some of the high-end software tools do support this sort of probabilistic uh, uh, scheduling. So a key message converted uh, given here was that in uh, uh, the probabilistic scheduling, we take the uh, time brackets and try to con identify the uh, expected activity duration based on this. So uh, we will be reading through all of this and trying to convert this data into optimistic, most likely, and a pessimistic duration, and the expected activity duration and the standard deviation. So give it a go, and uh, you can uh, share your uh, answers uh, with the colleagues uh, through the uh, online forum. Right, so uh, we learned about the deterministic and probabilistic scheduling. Uh, now, the next important concept, uh, which is that of Slack or a float, why it is uh, important uh, to the project manager. Now, when we talk about resource management uh, and when we talk about addressing very, uh, various constraints, the idea of a Slack or a float becomes very, very important. So Slack is essentially the amount of time an activity can slip without causing uh, any uh, delay. So obviously all the critical activities have got a zero slack or a zero, zero float because you cannot muck about with the critical activities. The non-critical activities have got a slack and this knowledge of slack is very important to the project manager because it represents the degree uh, of the flexibility the project manager will have in rearranging work and resources. A project uh, network with several near critical uh, paths and hence little slack gives the project manager little flexibility in terms of uh, changing resources or rearranging the uh, work. So having a clear up idea about uh, what's the flat float or slack of different activities uh, is quite important. Right, so we uh, in the last problem set we talked about uh, this uh, case study of uh, developing uh, a, a pump house uh, to help the people struck uh, in a calamity. Uh, so the uh, project method statement was given where it was identified the first task is drilling of well, which would take this much duration, and this is the uh, resources assigned to the task, and then uh, it follows on uh, the second activity. Once the well has been dug, you should start the pump house construction, which would take uh, this much duration and this much resources. So the first uh, uh, challenge this solving in this problem was to convert this method statement into a visual network diagram which uh, is very much uh, like this so basically we try to study the logic as given out in the method statement and uh, develop uh, in the first instance the network diagram which indicate the logical relationships and once we have done the network diagram then we can start with uh, doing the forward pass which will help us calculate the uh, early start and the early finish time and then the backward pass which will help us calculate the late finish time and the late start time and then by subtracting this box at the bottom from the box at the top gives us the float or uh, f or slack of different activities so this helps us basically identify what is the float and slack of different activities now the next thing is to convert this information into a gantt chart or a bar chart. So here you can see uh, for the drilling of well, which is the first activity uh, shown here, the uh, start point is uh, the early start time is zero and the late finish time is 11. So these, these are two extreme points within which this activity can be undertaken. So you have got all the time from uh, the start of the project right to the uh, end of um, week 10 to do this activity, which in, in its own right only takes four weeks. Now, as a project manager, it is at your discretion when do you want to do this activity. You could decide to do it in the earliest possible time, or you could leave it and do it in the middle time, or when you, uh, you could in, in leave it to the last minute. So a decision would primarily be, be based on what sort of constraints you are facing. Uh, so, but this indicates your uh, playing area. Now here you can observe that activity and, and the excavation activity uh, basically has got a float of zero, which means that this is a critical activity. So you have got no chance, no flexibility. It has to be delivered in uh, uh, during this period. And this 
you, you might have noticed that this activity has a duration which is shown here is a five days so these five days are blocked for this activity that you can't uh, muck about uh, with this activity uh, at all uh, whereas if we look at the other uh, activities such as a delivery of a material uh, now this activity has a duration of two week and two uh, days uh, and these are the two extreme points so you could uh, undertake the delivery of material activity uh, within this uh, uh, time frame and it is at your discretion when do you want to do so you can either occupy the first two weeks or uh, leave it or uh, do it the way you like so uh, basically the uh, board lines here shows the critical activities which cannot be changed and the uh, um, uh, and the lines uh, lighter lines here indicates the two extremes the early start and the late finish times now uh, it is then uh, at the work uh, the uh, project manager's discretion how they want to uh, plan their project so here the star indicates the work day so in this particular case the uh, project manager has chosen what we call an early start strategy so the decision is to do the work in the first possible opportunity so the decision was on the drilling of well you decided to uh, work on the first four and the last uh, weeks are left as a float or a slack which is a good decision uh, in in fact the project manager wants to reduce the risk uh, here so you have got a certain cushion to absorb any uh, uh, untoward incident so for instance if drilling of well could not be completed on week three for instance uh, even if it spills into week five it would not have any impact on the project and deadline so enough float to uh, accommodate uh, any untoward incident so this could be one strategy or uh, for certain reasons, the uh, project manager could plan this project using another extreme, which is could be based on late start time in comparison with the early start time. So if <clears throat> uh, the project managers take that option, uh, then the uh, uh, work would be taken in the later part uh, of the activity. So the float is being used earlier on, you can see, and the work is taking place uh, towards the end of the project now here you can see this project becomes very risky because if anything goes wrong in uh, the week nine uh, there is no float to uh, absorb the impact and uh, any uh, that would mean the overall project duration would increase so not a very clever strategy uh, because this makes it very risky so the float is being utilized up front and the work is being done uh, uh, later on so these were the two extremes you uh, saw the early start timings and the late start timings now if uh, we uh, take the early start uh, uh, option which was shown in the uh, previous slide and start loading our resources onto it so here you can see uh, in in the uh, description problem description the resources required are uh, shown here so for instance uh, the drilling of well uh, uh, requires a certain amount of people so this is given in your problem statement of what is the resource requirement for each uh, activity so if you start uh, loading uh, uh, each activity uh, with its resource required so here you can see that drilling of well requires four persons per day uh, as set out in, in the uh, uh, problem uh, uh, statement and the delivery of material for instance takes uh, four uh, uh, workers per day and it has got a duration of uh, two days now uh, so, so basically you start loading your resources onto your Gantt chart and uh, this would start uh, giving you an overall idea about resource consumption uh, on a day-by-day -day basis now uh, our strategy is usually to avoid a lot of uh, peaks and troughs so here you can see uh, the uh, week one starts with 19 uh, workers week two 19 week three uh, 18 and then we fail to find the work for six workers so uh, we are basically uh, firing them we don't need them and then it falls down to 10 
rising back again uh, in week six. Now, in terms of a flow and in terms of a productivity, such peaks and drops could be catastrophic. So what we would like to do is to end up with a more smoother uh, resource profile uh, in the project. And uh, how do we do it? It is primarily through utilizing the uh, resource, uh, 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 sorry, a float or slack where it is available. So here you can see uh, the, uh, uh, there is certain resource load in the initial few weeks, which is dying down towards uh, week four and five. So to have a more balanced profile, the project manager is uh, taking a decision to possibly, uh, because activity and the first activity and excavation uh, here is a critical activity, it cannot be changed. But here you can see we, we have got a, quite a healthy float here and, and quite a healthy float uh, uh, here. So the decision taken is to move uh, one of those activities with float to slightly later uh, in the project to reduce the uh, demand. So here you can see the final resource profile which is looking much more smoother uh, and there is uh, not such a huge peaks and troughs 13, 13, 15, 15 and this is uh, being achieved by uh, delaying the work on activity power line. So here in the previous slide, you can see the power line takes six workers per, uh, 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 per week, uh, which is a phenomenal amount of resource consumption. So, uh, and at the same time, uh, this activity has got a huge amount of float. So delaying uh, start of this activity from the beginning to slightly later, uh, the resource uh, uh, peak demand from the early uh, days have been uh, reduced. Right, so uh, this way we uh, saw that uh, how the knowledge of uh, uh, the float could be used to achieve a more uh, smoother uh, resource profile. So uh, this sort of, um, uh, approach is uh, often called uh, resource unit aggregation chart or resource histograms and uh, um, most of the modern project management software allows for a production of such resource histograms which gives you a good idea about how your resources including your manpower resources your machinery resources and your cost uh, resources are being uh, managed so you can uh, achieve a, a more smoother uh, profile so here you can see uh, the activities uh, the gray line indicating the duration of each activity and this number here indicating the resources required uh, in each uh, activity so uh, this is the total uh, resource uh, uh, requirement on a week by week basis so on week one just requiring 10 workers uh, week two requiring 18 and uh, week three requiring eight and then converting this information into a resource histogram uh, uh, we can see uh, this. So resource histogram is uh, the first key step in developing a clear visual picture of uh, how resources are being uh, used. Now, as I said, we like to avoid a lot of peaks and troughs because peaks and troughs come with costs. For, for instance, if it's a, a heavy duty construction machinery, every time you come and bring the, your heavy machinery to the site, you have to pay certain mobilization charges and demobilization charge. So you will rather keep the machinery on site for three uh, weeks rather than uh, bringing in uh, for just one week and then uh, bringing it later. Right, so these sort of a charts are called resource loading or resource aggregation charts, uh, which provides a summation on a period by period basis of the resources required to uh, complete all the activities. And uh, so we can see the logic of developing resource histograms. We start by our method statements, we convert it into a network diagram, then we do the forward pass, backward pass calculations, we identify the float slack, and then we convert it into bar charts, Gantt charts, we load our resources onto those bar charts and Gantt charts, and then convert it into resource loading or resource aggregation charts. Right, so we will uh, just do a few case studies to get uh, an example uh, uh, of uh, how would we schedule in a project without any constraints or uh, scheduling in projects with uh, with constraints. So most logically, you would be working in projects with clearly defined constraints, but there are certain projects like uh, this one uh, where uh, 
the constraints were not so uh, huge. So the cl uh, clients and the owners set out a brief, which was very simple. They wanted a building which could not be, uh, which has never been constructed before and which could not be constructed again. And that was a very simple brief uh, given by the project clients. And in terms of a time, cost, uh, other uh, constraints, they were not so huge. So how do we plan uh, for projects? We, are, we have not so clearly uh, defined constraints, which is a, an ideal uh, situation. So the process would be uh, the same. We would start by identifying our key tasks and activities. So this is um, one of the case study uh, talking about uh, uh, how do we uh, plan for our resources and equipment load uses uh, in a situation where we have got no constraints. So uh, just uh, give it a go. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if you have done it right, you should end up uh, in calculations like these. So starting the project in day zero and, and the uh, as you can see in the previous slide, the duration of each activity is shown in the middle box here. Uh, so zero at three is three and the subsequent activity starting from three and then adding three on and six and likewise. And so you do your forward pass calculations, the backward pass calculations, and then you identify the uh, critical path which is uh, running through uh, here. So these are the activities uh, one has to be extra uh, watchful uh, about. Right now, in this particular case study, uh, we have been uh, uh, given uh, uh, different uh, resource requirements. So here, for instance, activity B, uh, you, you can see here it has a duration of uh, three months, and and it requires uh, two D8 uh, caterpillars, uh, machinery, and uh, the uh, total cost of this activity B is 90,000 uh, pounds and uh, as it's a three months activity this is equally split so every month the cash flow would be uh, 30,000 uh, pounds per month. Uh, likewise activity D uh, would be uh, D. So the first thing is uh, to uh, develop a cost uh, uh, loaded bar chart for the project manager, uh, including the cost uh, histogram. So uh, we will start with the first activity, which is, we can see uh, in this project is the activity uh, B. And uh, that's the first activity which is taking place uh, before any other activity can take place. And we can see here that the uh, cost of this activity is 30 grants uh, uh, per month. Uh, so we would have a cash requirement of 30 uh, in the first week and moving to 30 in the second and uh, 30 uh, in the week three. And uh, this is followed by uh, activity uh, D. And now we are assuming an uh, early start uh, sort of a situation. And uh, activity D uh, has a... Uh, again, a duration of uh, uh, th three uh, three months, which is shown by this middle box here, and every month it is requiring uh, 40 grants. So you, you would be requiring uh, 40, uh, uh, 40, and uh, uh, 40 here. Right. So likewise, uh, you would need to. Uh, do this for the all uh, other activities. Uh, activity uh, K uh, has a duration of five, and uh, it, it it has a budget of sixty thousand uh, pounds per week. So uh, you would be loading activity uh, K uh, with uh, sixty. For the uh, five weeks period and the uh, activity uh, H has a duration of four and uh, it has got a, a 30 grand so you would be loading the bar chart with the uh, cost requirement for uh, this uh, particular activity so far so good and uh, we, likewise we would be uh, completing the uh, entire uh, equation. Now this would give us uh, sort of a accumulated values, uh, accumulated cost required. So we can see that the project required 30,000 uh, 
uh, on in the uh, first week of the project uh, or uh, then uh, again 30,000 uh, in the second week and uh, then there is a certain peak uh, so we will be replying 130 uh, by week uh, month three or whatever time unit we are using and uh, again 130 Uh, here and likewise 130 in uh, week five and so far we, we will calculate using the similar logic the next thing will be to uh, develop a, a cost a histogram so starting with 30 30 and uh, then um, moving to week three there is a certain uh, certain peak uh, 130 130 right now there is a strategy certain contractors uh, use they try to front load all their costs so they could uh, get an earlier payment uh, from the clients which uh, uh, is not always looked very much positively looked at and uh, which uh, could create a mistrust so uh, it has to be a uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, front loading of the cost is not uh, Good and the uh, it has to be proportional. The costs uh, should be proportional to the work being accomplished on the site. So this way we learn how to develop the cost loaded um, bar charts and cost loaded uh, histograms. The next thing is using a similar logic. We could uh, load our resources, which in this case is the uh, uh, the. Uh, have a duty d8 uh, caterpillars required for each activity so here you can see the first activity b requires uh, two caterpillars so we will be uh, it has got a duration of three so we would need two caterpillars for uh, this and activity three uh, activity d requires uh, two again uh, so using a similar logic here we are uh, trying to manage uh, our uh, heavy duty machinery uh, and we would uh, complete this and uh, we will develop a corresponding uh, histogram to give us a, a visual picture on this right so uh, so have a go uh, uh, on this one and uh, my so I believe, oh yes, I had uh, the uh, so uh, this is. Uh, Uh, this is the uh, cost uh, histogram so if, if you um, keep using the similar logic uh, we would end up in a cost histogram uh, like this uh, so here you can see a bit of a, a, a trough halfway through and a, a, sli a slightly um, big peak but that's uh, uh, often referred to as, uh, as a quite common the construction project starts steadily where we are clearing the site and installing utilities some initial activities but uh, midway through uh, we have a certain burst of activities and these activities uh, tend to slow down uh, towards the end of the project so here you can uh, see uh, we have explored uh, two uh, extreme options uh, to suit uh, our cash flow requirement. One was uh, planning the project on the early dates and the other option which was explored was planning the uh, project uh, using the late dates. Uh, so uh, based on this, we uh, can produce uh, two different sort of a, uh, 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 plan value charts so how we uh, uh, our plan spend is so here you can see the blue line indicating the early uh, spend uh, time and the uh, pink line indicating the uh, late uh, timings uh, 
Now, mind you, uh, this sort of a curve, which is based on the plan uh, spending, is also called an S curve because it very much looks like a shape of an S. Now, here, the key things to note is that the S has got a steady rise, not very uh, sharp rise. And uh, in the week four or five, we have got a certain uh, peak, so quite a vertical rise, and then things uh, uh, slowing down uh, towards the uh, end. Uh, so uh, very often, uh, this is a tool used by owners to make sure that the expenses claimed by the contractors are proportional, because if there is a certain vertical rise right at the beginning, that may raise, raise an uh, alarm bell. So uh, for most of the construction projects, we have uh, such a, a, a profile. So we learned here that uh, the uh, early start uh, uh, timings and the late start timings give us some flexibility to adjust our uh, cost resources and to plan uh, according to uh, the constraints uh, which would uh, suit us. And the, the other example which we saw was uh, that of uh, management of resources. And uh, uh, so uh, if we Uh, <clears throat> so this is how a resource loaded uh, uh, chart would look like. So this is an example uh, where we have managed our costs and resources without any explicit constraints. So there was no constraint here. We uh, here you can see uh, we are quite using the machinery as we wish. So uh, we start started with two and then we started with nine uh, 11 halfway through and then falling down to four 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 and two it's not such a, uh, uh, a smoother resource profile so when we will uh, talk about the theory we will learn that the flow is very important and uh, just bringing a huge uh, amount of equipment on uh, on to your site one day and then not needing it on the other day it doesn't do any good for the flow of the activities taking place on the site so we would like and very often a lot of projects have got a constraint so you do not live in a, uh, in an ideal world where you could have as many resources as you want very often you would be given a constraint that you cannot have any more than uh, four uh, cats uh, in on this project so it will be very important to schedule this project uh, under those constraints. So we will discuss it. But in this example, the idea was just to indicate what we, we do where you have got no constraints at all. So in this project, we have got no constraints and we ended up with a, a, a resource histogram with quite sharp uh, peaks. Right, so uh, coming to the next topic, which is scheduling with constraints. Now, it's very important to recognize that the projects uh, face different types of constraints and limitations. Uh, so one example of a project could be a time constraint project, a project that must be completed by an imposed date. So here, uh, time is fixed. There is no way. So for instance, it could be a shopping center which has to be uh, open before Christmas holidays to make sure that the uh, retailers get maximum leverage and through the to the uh, Christmas shoppers. So they could set out a date that it uh, the project must be complete by September or so. So the time is fixed. And uh, as the time becomes fixed, they have to ensure that resources are flexible because you are trying to address this constraint and um, maybe uh, resources or the cost may uh, compromise. Uh, additional resources are required to uh, ensure project meets the schedule. So here, the uh, key uh, word is a time constraint, and the time is like a hanging sword uh, on the uh, head. The other example of a project could be uh, a resource constraint project, a project in which the level of resources available cannot be exceeded. Uh, resources are fixed, so you have got two people to work with or a certain number of equipment to work with. And uh, if that is the situation, then possibly your project may have to face overrun. Time becomes flexible, inadequate resources, and we delay the project. So a keyword in uh, here is the resource, uh, which is constrained. And uh, as a result, uh, we 
dis discuss that three dimensions, golden triangle, cost, quality, and time. And very often when you're focusing too sharply on one dimension, the other ones may suffer. So here, uh, as you're focusing on resource, maybe your project timeline will have to exceed to deliver the project with minimal amount of uh, possible resources. And the third constraint is a physical constraint. Sometimes the site is constrained. So for instance, uh, uh, there's a lot of work in the ceiling area of a building. Uh, this is a quite cramped up and it involves a lot of contractors. It may involve people uh, uh, from a cabling uh, contractors, the electrical contractors, the uh, uh, and the others who manage the data networks. Uh, so very small, tight area and too many people to work in. Uh, so physical constraint becomes uh, another type of a uh, constraint which project managers need to be uh, aware of. So uh, what do we do in a case of a time constrained uh, uh, projects where we have to manage our resources in a time constrained uh, uh, situation? So project that must be completed by an impose date. It requires the use of leveling techniques and that focus on balancing or uh, smoothing uh, resource demand by using a positive slack or the delaying of the non-critical activities to manage resource utilization over the duration uh, of the project. Uh, here, peak resource demands are uh, reduced and resources over the life uh, uh, of a project uh, are reduced. Fluctuation in, in resource demand is minimized. I think it will become clear if you look at a, a few examples. Uh, so uh, I think we, we did touch upon uh, uh, this uh, example, uh, I think this is an example of a resource constraint. So if we are have been told that uh, all we could have is a uh, two uh, backhoes uh, available to us, so uh, we, we can do an initial uh, resource histogram here. So here you can see the first two uh, months and we are using uh, two uh, resource. Uh, <coughs> uh, uh, backhoes and then as we uh, enter into the month four uh, sorry week four uh, so whichever time you, unit we are using uh, we, we require four which is falling down uh, to uh, only uh, one backhoe and moving back again to three backhoes uh, later in the project so here uh, if you have a constraint that you can all you can have is a maximum uh, two backhoes it will be very important to uh, manage accordingly. So if that is the constraint, we will have to see uh, where is the float. So here we can see there is some healthy float uh, and with uh, this irrigation activity and some healthy float here with fencing and uh, uh, wall activity. Uh, so we can explore uh, postponing uh, one of the activity. I think uh, we would again struggle to deliver this project in this time frame if we, if we are all we have got is two backhoes because this would mean that we can postpone this activity but again uh, this and the lighting activity cannot go on concurrently so this would mean that our project cannot be finished on week 24 because it's a very severe resource constrained environment so we can request uh, our owners and ask them if they would let us um, allow three rather than two because with two backhoes we cannot deliver this project in this timeline so we do our negotiation and the uh, news have come back that they have agreed and we could have three so if it is possible three is possible then we could possibly uh, take away this activity and move it into uh, week 10 to 12 and our new uh, resource histogram uh, would be uh, one and if, if you're moving this uh, we would just have two here and over here we would uh, just require three and uh, and we would end up with uh, three and uh, towards and so we, we could deliver this project with three backhoes in the stipulated period but if it is a two backhoes uh, we our time dimension will be compromised and uh, so either the uh, <clears throat> decision has to be taken to increase the number of resources or provide some flexibility in terms of a timeline to deliver this project uh, with a given time frame. Right, so uh, in terms of resource leveling techniques, 
all leveling techniques uh, use the same method. They basically delay the non-critical activities by making use of the positive slack to reduce the peak demand. So as you saw in the previous example, we made use of this non-critical activities and we made use of this slack period here to uh, address the issues, fill in the valleys for the resources. Resource leveling or smoothening uh, involves the uh, in attempting to even out demands on resources by using slack, delaying non-critical activities to manage resource utilization. Resource concerned projects, uh, projects that involve resources that are limited in quantity or by their availability, scheduling of activities for the use of heuristics. Uh, uh, rule of thumb that focus on a minimum slack, smallest lease duration, and lowest activity identification number. So in projects where we are constrained by our resources, where we are told that all you can have is two workers on this task, or all you can have is uh, two uh, caterpillars uh, to work with on this project, uh, then we have to prioritize different activities. And most of the computer software use these sort of heuristics. So they tend to give priority to the activities based on these rule of thumbs. So first is the minimum slack, the second is, is smallest and least duration and the uh, lowest activity identification number uh, as allocated by the uh, computer. So we will do an example to get a better feel of uh, this. And uh, uh, the method which we used to address such resource constraint uh, projects is called a parallel method which is an iterative process that starts at the first time period of the project and schedules uh, period by period any activities scheduled to start using uh, the three priority rules which are given here. So starting with minimum slack, then the smallest least duration and the lowest activity identification uh, number. Uh, so the key advantages of this method is peak resource demand, uh, demands are reduced, resource over the life of the project is uh, reduced and fluctuation in resource demand is minimized. Uh, okay, so I think uh, we have covered uh, this aspect. There's some duplication slides there. Okay, so uh, ha have a look through uh, this uh, uh, problem. And here you can see uh, one obvious problem. Uh, we have been told that we cannot have any more than two uh, pieces of, uh, let's assume, heavy duty equipment, uh, let's call it caterpillars. Okay, so we cannot have any uh, more than two caterpillars uh, uh, on our job. And uh, here in this example, the resources requirements are uh, shown uh, here in the uh, medium boxes. So we see uh, this column here is the early start time. So we can uh, start the, uh, which basically indicates the uh, the two extremes so for instance activity a has got an early start time of zero and the late finish time for activity a is uh, two over here and the slack which is shown here is uh, zero for this activity likewise we can complete this table by looking at the first box to complete so activity c the early start time is uh, two for activity b the early start time again uh, is uh, uh, two and the late finish time for activity B is five, and the late finish time for activity C is uh, five again, and the slack for C is zero, whereas slack for B is uh, two. Right, so this way you would complete this table. So let's uh, start uh, loading our resources onto this uh, bar chart. So the first activity uh, is activity A and it basically requires uh, two uh, pieces of heavy machinery. So this would mean that we would be requiring uh, two pieces of machinery in the uh, first two weeks of our project. So far, so good. Uh, now, as we start uh, uh, the work after week two, uh, we and there are two activities taking place in parallel. Uh, the total duration of uh, activity B is, uh, is one week and it requires, uh, so the duration is shown here, which is a DUR, uh, and uh, so it has got a one week duration and it requires two pieces of equipment. And the duration of activity C is 
uh, three and uh, uh, it again requires two pieces of equipment so we would be requiring uh, two pieces of equipment here now this is where the first uh, resource uh, stretch comes to play uh, in the week uh, after uh, the second week we are we would be requiring four caterpillars which is not allowed because we have been told explicitly by our clients that all we could have to we have to work is two so uh, we learned that in such sort of a resource concerned environment your time would suffer so this project as you can see here previously had a, a deadline of 12 weeks now we'll see in a, such a resource concerned environment can we still deliver this project in 12 weeks or not now this is for one thing sure we have to make a decision between activity B and C, which activity do we need to prioritize? So in terms of uh, this decision making, we go back to our set of rules. So the first rule is look for the activity which has got a minimum slack and prioritize it. So we see the slack for activity C is zero and the slack for activity B is uh, two. So the logic suggests that we need to give preference to activity C and not activity D, which means that activity D uh, cannot take place here. We give preference to activity C and now activity D would take place at this time period. Uh, and uh, activity D obviously uh, would now take place uh, uh, after activity uh, B has completed because the logic remains the same activity B must finish so activity D has got a uh, one uh, week duration so activity D is going to take place here at this spot now uh, once we have completed activity D we can begin work on activity E and F uh, in parallel uh, so activity E requires uh, two, uh, two caterpillars and activity F requires one caterpillar. So if we start loading it, uh, activity E, if I load it, it has got a uh, total duration of uh, uh, two weeks and uh, two caterpillars required here. And activity F uh, having a uh, duration of uh three weeks and requiring one caterpillar so it becomes quite obvious we cannot uh do work on both of these activities in parallel again we have to make a decision which activity shall we prioritize again we go back to our rules and check the rules the first rule was minimum slack so activity e has the minimum slack and when you compare it with activity f thus we have taken a decision to uh, keep activity where it is and we will be uh, moving the activity F now we can we will not be beginning it uh, uh, here uh, so activity so we have to complete activity E now and then once E has finished as the logic suggests we have the two options we can commence work on activity G or activity F so the new situation is I would drop this because uh, uh, we uh, so we have to now make a new decision uh, in terms of which activity to prioritize so uh, basically we could commence work on activity uh, f which requires one uh, caterpillar for uh, three uh, weeks concurrently and also uh, as per the logic we could begin work on activity G as well which requires uh, two uh, backhoes now again we have to make a decision on which activity to prioritize now uh, again the first one is minimum slack now here slightly uh, uh, important question to recognize is that the slack here was calculated based on the early start and early uh, uh, late start timings from the uh, but situation has now changed so 
for activity F in the new uh, regime, the early start time is not six, but in fact it is it is uh, nine. And likewise here in G, it is not uh, eight, but it is nine. So uh, if we do the slack here, it should not be one. Uh, it should be under new situation minus two, basically, because this activity is being delayed. And here it would be minus one, uh, because the early start times uh, have changed quite substantially. So in this situation, we prioritize activity F first. We try to do uh, activity F first. Uh, and once we have finished with activity F, uh, then we uh, give uh, two days to activity G and the last activity would be activity uh, H. So here you can see we delivered this project not in the originally planned 12 weeks but uh, in 16 weeks because uh, we uh, were faced in a situation where we had to work in a resource constrained environment. Right, so in this situation we learned that we often have to prioritize activities and the rules that uh, we, which we use uh, include three rules, minimum slack, smallest duration, and the lowest identification numbers. So uh, just a, a sort of a recap, uh, we, uh, uh, we make use of our leveling over resources and the knowledge of the early start times and the late start times become very important. So here you can see the uh, solid line here showing the activities which are critical and the uh, solid black line indicating the resource requirements for the early start periods and the dotted line here indicating resource requirements for the late start period. So this basically allows us a, a sort of a uh, room to play with. So if we just use an early start time, you can see there is a huge amount of uh, 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 peaks and troughs and if we make use of the late start time it is giving us a much more smoother profile so perhaps that could be much more cost effective for our project and better flow if we deliver this project delivering a late start time so even though uh, uh, working on a late start time it could be more risky but in this case it appears that late start time uh, would provide us with a much more smoother profile so again uh, the CN which has to be taken in case of real life constraints uh, <clears throat> being uh, addressed. Uh, another key issue uh, which uh, is often used in terms of management of uh, resources is splitting an activity or multitasking so it's a scheduling technique used to get a better project schedule and increase uh, resource utilization it involves interrupting work on an activity to employ the resource on another activity then returning the resource to finish the interrupted work uh, is feasible when startup and shutdown costs are low is considered the major reason why projects fail to meet the schedule Right, so here if we look at an example of this resource uh, histogram, which is uh, activities are shown here, resource requirements for each activity, uh, duration shown here, early start, late finish time shown here. Now here we can see uh, there is uh, a bit of a trough here, uh, halfway uh, through the project and a bit of a trough here. Now here uh, we could possibly use and explore if uh, our uh, situation allows to uh, avoid this sort of a massive uh, trough which is happening here by splitting the activity C. So if by any chance, if we can split activity C into two work packages and delivering half of it uh, in stage one and taking and delivering uh, the remaining half, that would help us squeeze the project. So here the duration was 14 uh, weeks. But if we uh, split this activity C into two different stages, we can um, reduce our overall project duration. And also we could reduce the resource imbalance, uh, which was in the uh, previous situation. So we, we observed here that splitting an activity uh, sometimes could be used as a, another strategy to accelerate our projects and to reduce the uh, overall uh, duration. 
So this is an example of activity duration without splitting. Uh, here, activity duration is split into uh, three segments, A, B, and C. But one thing uh, which is important to recognize is that splitting is not as simple as splitting a cake into three pieces. Uh, very often, while splitting, there is certain shutdown and the startup costs uh, involved. So the overall duration of an activity may slightly increase in case of a splitting. So this uh, sort of a demobilization, mobilization has to be considered. So different activities have their own uh, situation. So there may be few activities which could not be split at all, uh, may not be possible at all. But this is uh, another uh, tool in the project managers uh, toolbox to see if there is an option. Right, so this is uh, some theory uh, about uh, the sort of concepts which we have briefly covered, so I'm not going to delve uh, too much deep into it. We have previewed, this is an example illustration of a, a project from Microsoft uh, product uh, and showing uh, different dependencies, different disadvantages, uh, so the slides are available and you can uh, go through it uh, in your free time. Uh, this slide is again conveying a similar message of uh, uh, how do we make use of uh, the resource time and float time, how do we convert this uh, network diagram into uh, this. So there are certain uh, additional problems uh, if you want to uh, get your hands and, and do some more practice into it, uh, they will be uh, good. Uh, so this is uh, uh, another illustration of the parallel method uh, or heuristics which we have seen. So here you can see the uh, uh, the project network diagram here. Uh, this project network is uh, translated into a, a bar chart where you can see certain activities have got some uh, healthy float. And you can also see uh, the uh, schedule without any uh, constraints. So this is number of uh, uh, persons, personnel required for uh, each activity. Again, some uh, peak flow uh, in the week three, uh, four, and then falling down to one person uh, at a later stage uh, in the project. However, in this particular scenario, we have been given a constraint that we cannot have any more than three persons uh, uh, per uh, <clears throat> So uh, again, we will have to make use of the heuristics, the concept which we uh, discussed previously, and we will have to uh, postpone certain activities. Uh, so uh, here you can see in the previous situation, the uh, resource requirement in week three was five, which means that some one of the activity has to be uh, prioritized. And the rule that we learned is that minimum slack activities need to be given the priority. Uh, so here uh, the uh, activity uh, four has got a slack of six, but uh, it is not creating so much of a problem. The problem is being created by an activity requiring two resources. So the competition was primarily between activity two and three, and three has got a zero slack, so that has to be prioritized, which means the activity two has to move further down in the uh, project. So that's why activity two uh, has to move down uh, further in this project and uh, so far and so on. So we, we have seen this thing in our previous uh, example. So I'm not going to delve uh, deep uh, again, but if you struggle to uh, understand uh, the concepts, we, we can always uh, <coughs> uh, revisit it. Right, so we have covered quite a few uh, grounds related to uh, um, management of resources and how do we manage resources when uh, in, in an unconstrained environment and uh, in situations where we, where we have a certain constraint. The last uh, topic which I will be covering in this session is uh, crashing a project, uh, which primarily means project acceleration. Certain times we come uh, in a situation where projects have to be delivered quickly. It relates to resource commitments. The more resources expanded, the uh, faster the projects uh, to finish. So very often, uh, time becomes a constraint. I give you an example of a retail project uh, facing a deadline to before Christmas season. Uh, so the project has to be delivered quickly. So very often, we 
deploy additional resources. We may be getting people working on double shifts to get the projects uh, achieved uh, quickly. So this is another sort of a constraint, time constraint, or sometimes uh, we could have a mishap in one of the earlier work packages in our project where we suffer delays and the certain uh, uh, preceding activities had to be crashed and accelerated to uh, uh, cover for the earlier losses in a project. So a question to reflect on why shall we reduce project duration or why shall we crash a project and there could be a number of a wide range of reasons and uh, some of these uh, which we discussed earlier uh, with the students include things like client requirements, there could be political pressures or there could be contractual commitments, uh, there could be late penalty clauses and thus the contractor is forced to deliver the project early or time to market pressures. Uh, there are certain, sometimes incentive contracts, there are uh, bonuses for early completion. So maybe by deploying some additional resources, if you could claim some of those bonuses, that could be an uh, attractive option. Or sometimes there are unforeseen delays and pressure to move resources to other projects uh, or to complete the project as soon as possible or time is money. So there could be a number of different situations which a project manager could come across which may initiate uh, the need for crashing a project. Now one thing uh, which needs to be kept in mind is that once you start accelerating a project your cost dimension could suffer so we again coming back to our golden triangle uh, cost quality uh, time if time becomes the premium uh, choice then you may be the clients may be must be willing to pay some additional costs. So there are certain additional costs involved when you try to rush activities uh, quickly. Right, so here is a, a question for you to reflect on. Activity B and H can be reduced by uh, two weeks. Uh, which activity uh, should be reduced in uh, this case? So you, you um, are working with a contractor and who has given you an option that they could possibly squeeze two weeks either from activity B or from activity H and which uh, activity if you are given a choice uh, would you uh, uh, which uh, you would reduce the duration of so the term which we often use uh, in terms of reducing a duration is crashing an activity so which activity would you prefer to crash activity b or activity h now one important thing uh, here to note is the uh, the uh, the slack here and, and the critical path line running through uh, here so all these activities with zero slack uh, comprise your uh, critical path Right, so we learned that the duration of a project is determined by the duration of the critical path or the path which are all zero activities and uh, uh, reducing an activity uh, which is a non-critical activity such as uh, B which already has got uh, a float of two is not going to make any impact. So uh, the message being conveyed in this slide is that if you have to crash an activity it must be an activity on the critical path to deliver you the time benefits uh, reducing uh, or crashing a non-critical activity is not going to be uh, beneficial so we learned that uh, if we have got an option to crash an activity it must be a critical uh, activity so uh, in this uh, next example we will learn uh, what do we do when we have to accelerate projects and uh, what are the key steps involved so the first one is you have to create your critical path model uh, and which we learned previously you have to list the number of days each task may be reduced by so this may you talking to the contractor telling them about the new situation your project is facing and asking them to explore if they could work in double shifts and they could uh, reduce the activity uh, time for their respective work packages and list cost of reducing the task by one day so or, or one week whichever year you are uh, you, so your contractor will tell you, for instance, that they could uh, work uh, double shift, but that would cost you another 
1000 pound but it would uh, you can have the uh, work done uh, a day in uh, advance so you have to list the cost of reducing the task and then you reduce the task along the critical path with the uh, least cost of uh, reduction and then you recalculate the critical path and then you go through these iterations uh, and uh, <clears throat> and then you graph the levels of reduction with the cost. So you have to go through uh, multiple iterations to uh, do the crash analysis. So let's see uh, one uh, example and uh, explore uh, what uh, how uh, it could be done. So the problem here is that you are being asked uh, to help your client to find out the lowest possible time and the cost to finish this project. So the client is asking that whatever uh, humanly is possible, they would like to deliver this project in the lowest possible time and the lowest possible cost. Um, so uh, <clears throat> an ideal situation. So in the table below, you will find two activity times and two costs specified for each activity. So the normal time is the time which is given to you by contractors. This is their normal working time. So this guy has told you uh, uh, working on activity A that their normal working period is uh, one week and uh, the normal cost will be 100,000. Uh, and their active contractor B is telling you that the normal time to deliver an activity uh, as specified in work package B is three weeks and the normal cost is 150 uh, and this this is uh, the cost uh, if you are using a unit of a week and that would be uh, 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 cost per week. Uh, and now act guy A is telling you that they cannot crash the project. This activity will take one week. It's not possible for them. It could be some uh, very basic work and they, there is no possibility they could crash. So this, it is specified that this activity cannot be crashed. Uh, the contractor B is telling you that it's possible for them to reduce uh, the time from uh, three weeks by up to two weeks so they could cut off two weeks of their time but for each week there will be an additional charge of uh, so uh, this is crash cost per week so additional 100,000 uh, per week the client has to pay. Uh, activity C the normal time was four weeks uh, and the contractor has told you it could possibly uh, work double shift and uh, reduce the time by one week but the crash cost would be 50,000 uh, per week and likewise you can see the activity D it can only be reduced by one week activity E can be reduced by uh, two weeks and activity F and can be crashed by one week and this is the additional cost which will be uh, involved here so uh, we start by jotting down uh, these costs uh, and uh, doing our basic uh, network diagram and we have put you a note here with one X with one which means that this activity has got a zero crash time it cannot be crashed uh, so we try to calculate what is the overall duration of this project so uh, if we look at the path on the top uh, activity A has got one week duration B has got three weeks D three weeks and F five weeks so this path has got a B D F has a total duration of uh, 10 weeks and the path at the bottom has got a duration of four four eight nine ten eleven twelve weeks so we learned that the uh, critical path is the longest part of your uh, project. So this A, C, E, and F comprise your uh, critical path. So far, so good. So uh, the normal time to deliver this project is 12 weeks. So delivering this project in a normal situation would be 12 weeks. And the cost of delivering this project would be a summation of all these costs okay so if you take some time and do a summation of all these costs and let's see how much it comes to yeah any guesses Okay. 
So I think uh, it appears the total summation of this column is the normal cost. And uh, so two and two and two is 600, 150 and 150 is uh, 300, 900 and 1000. So the normal time is 12 weeks and the normal cost to deliver this project is uh, 1000. Right, so now we see uh, if we can squeeze uh, one week from this uh, project. So is it possible to deliver this project in 11 weeks? So that's our next job to reduce the duration from 12 weeks to 11 weeks. And we have to do it on a week by week basis. We cannot do two or three weeks in one go because situation after every week would change your critical path would change. So we will take one uh, as a unit uh, of iteration. Right, so if we have to reduce the duration of the activities, it has to be on the critical path. And uh, we have got three options, uh, either reducing activity C, uh, reducing activity E, or reducing activity F. Now we go back to our cost table and the cost which contractors have given us. So the contractor C is telling us they would cost 50, uh, E is telling us 70, and F is telling us they would cost us 90. So we go with the cheapest option, which was uh, the contractor C. So they said that they will be uh, able to crash our project by uh, one week. So in the new situation, we will be reducing the four uh, to three. So let's go to the next slide and uh, we will be making this change. So the other details remain the same, but this four gets to three. And mind you, the uh, activity C could be crashed by only one week, which was the maximum amount of time it could be crashed by, which we have already done. So this activity is no longer crashable. So we write three X, which means that this activity can no longer be crashed. Uh, but uh, doing this has uh, uh, increased our project cost by 50. So our new project cost uh, would be not 1000, but 1050. And now we will be in a position to deliver this project to uh, in, in an 11 week period. So that's one way for us to deliver this uh, project. Now we want to find an optimal uh, situation for our uh, client. So we, our next exploration is to further uh, reduce it from 11 weeks to 10 weeks. That's the uh, next goal. So to do this again, we have to recalculate the critical path. And uh, we start from the bottom path, which is AC, E, and F. And the duration is uh, 4, uh, 8, and 11. So the bottom path has got a duration of uh, uh, 11 weeks. And the path at the top has got a 6, uh, 9, and 10 weeks. So it appears that, again, the bottom path is the critical path. And uh, we need to uh, reduce and duration of an activity on the critical path to get us down from 11 to 10. The reducing non-critical path is not going to help us uh, at all. So non-critical, uh, so the, in terms of critical, only options are E and F. So we go back and check the cost table as uh, given. So the E contractor was telling us they, they are going to charge us 70,000 uh, and the F is charging us 90. 70 is a cheaper option. Uh, and this week could be crashed by up to uh, uh, two weeks. So we decide to crash activity uh, E here. So we will be reducing this four uh, to three. I'm not writing three X because it can, sorry, uh, it should not be uh, put it here. Uh, it should be. So this four is uh, now in a new situation, it becomes three. I'm not going to write an X because it can further be uh, crashed. So we have decided to crash. Uh, activity E and crashing an activity E means that uh, we have to pay an extra 70,000 uh, pounds to the contractors. So the new budget for our project becomes 1120 so here you can see the compromise we are reducing our time but we are increasing our costs uh, 
So activity A remains as was the situation previously from the top figure uh, and E becomes three, F would remain as it is, uh, B would become three and uh, D would become three. Our next uh, uh, plan would be to reduce further and accelerate from 10 weeks to uh, nine weeks. To do this, uh, we would again have to see where is the critical path lying. So the path at the top is three, six, nine, ten, and the path at the bottom is uh, four, uh, seven, and ten. So here you can see that both paths have become critical. This is what happens once you try to squeeze your project. Your project becomes much more risky and much more sensitive. So here the path at the top is a critical path and the path at the bottom is a critical path. So this means that if we have to reduce the duration either we have to uh, take a decision which would impact both the paths so either we reduce f uh, because if we just reduce the duration from activity b it is not going to have any impact on the bottom path so the overall duration will remain as a uh, 10 weeks so either it has to be a combination of b and e or a combination of a d and e or f alone so we have got three choices here. Uh, look at the summation of BE or a summation of DE or F alone. And uh, in all probability, it looks that crashing F alone is going to cost us 90. A combination of B and E would be very expensive. And the combination of uh, D and E, uh, uh, again, uh, is much more than cr um, um, and crashing F alone. So uh, it looks at this stage, crashing F uh, seems like the most plausible option as it is a, a joint activity in both the parts. So to reduce from 10 to 9 weeks, we decide to crash F. And crashing F uh, means uh, that the our project would incur an additional. Uh, so we are crashing F and this is at an additional cost of 90. Uh, key as specified by the contractor here. So your new project cost will be one two one zero here. And okay, so here in this example, the activity which was changed was E, and here the activity which is being changed is uh, F. And uh, I will be reducing this three to two X because, uh, mind you, in the previous example. Uh, it, it is specified here that activity F can only be crashed by one week, which we have utilized. So it cannot be further crashed. So this X indicates that this activity is not, not crashable anymore. Uh, every other information remains the same. So three here uh, and three X here as from the figure at the top, one X uh, here, uh, B uh, is the three and, and the D is a uh, three. All right, so that's, uh, you see how did we go from a 12 weeks project to a nine week project, but we have compromised over cost. So we started from a delivering a project at 100,000 at 12 weeks to uh, 1,210 in a nine week uh, duration. Our next goal is to get it down from nine weeks to uh, eight weeks. Now to do this, again, we have to see where is our critical path. So the path at the bottom is ACEF and it has got a duration of five eight and nine and the uh, six seven eight nine so the path at the bottom has got a duration of nine and the path at the top has six seven eight uh, nine so again this is clear that the both uh, path the top path and the bottom path both are critical so uh, this is now clear. Either we have to crash uh, the activities and B and E, because if we just crash B alone, that would have no impact on the bottom path, which would not serve our practice uh, purpose because the overall duration would remain as nine weeks. And likewise, if we crash uh, D or E on their own, it will not serve our purpose. So we take a combination. The combination is either we crash B, E, both activities in one go or uh, a DE. So we go back to the contract costs and see uh, which one is a plausible. So if we take a combination B and E, uh, B is costing us 100 and E is costing 70. So BE is uh, costing uh, 
170 and DE contractors if you crash both of them that's 130 so it looks like a DE is a better option uh, for our project so we decide to crash uh, activity D and E and uh, the new situation will be uh, the project will get down from nine weeks to eight weeks and uh, the timings on the B would go from down from because we already have crashed and B once ago before so uh, did we I think yes we have crashed and B before uh, so it will become uh, We will reduce uh, further. Uh, so in, in the previous case, it was three. Uh, now it will become uh, two. And uh, sorry, uh, we, we are not crashing in D here. Uh, so my fault. Uh, let me erase it. Uh, we are crashing D and uh, E in this situation. Uh, which is going to uh, give an, an additional 130,000 into our project. So our new project cost will be uh, 1340. And uh, we are crashing activity D and E in this situation. So uh, So crashing uh, D, uh, it can be only crashed once. So uh, so we will be taking it down from three to two X because it cannot be further crashed. And for activity E, uh, it will be 70. Uh, now, mind you, we already have crashed E uh, once before. Uh, so we, we already crashed E here, so again it will become X here. So activity E will become 2X and every other detail remains the same as is the situation at the top. So F would remain as a 2X. And B would be uh, three, C would be three uh, X, and E would be one X. So this is the new cost, and uh, to reduce it further from eight weeks to seven weeks, again we have to run through the same iteration. Uh, we look at the park at the bottom. It has got a five, uh, six, seven, eight, and nine, uh, nine week duration at the bottom, and the park at the top has got four, seven, uh, uh, and eight week uh, duration. Uh, but the problem is that path at the bottom is uh, the critical path and it is uncrashable. You can see the access appearing here. So this project has reached its optimal limit. It cannot be further crashed. So this project uh, has got two extremes. We could deliver it in eight weeks, costing the client 1,340,000 pounds, or we could have delivered it in 12 weeks, costing the client much lower, which is a 100,000. So we have got essentially two options on the plate. Now uh, we can, uh, plot this thing uh, as a cost time trade-off graph where uh, on, uh, on the x-axis is your project duration and on the y-axis is your project cost. So this is the normal uh, way of delivering a project and as you try to squeeze the project your cost tends to go high and high and high because you're trying to deliver uh, the project in minimal amount of time. So uh, you are compromising, you are gaining in terms of time, but you are losing in terms of uh, cost. So uh, very often we plot it as a cost time uh, graph where uh, we indicate a normal activity and a normal time to complete a uh, um, project and then the uh, uh, crash cost and the crash time 
to complete in a minimal amount of time. And uh, this slope is the crash cost per unit time. So the slope basically indicates the uh, <coughs> and crashing. So uh, in this particular example, uh, we saw the uh, direct cost, which we have calculated in our calculation. So we saw that if we delivered this project in 12 weeks time period, we would have a cost of 1000. And if we deliver this project in eight weeks, our cost would be 1340. So these, uh, this is, we, we are talking about direct costs, but mind you, there are a lot of indirect costs involved. So in case of a construction projects, for instance, you would have a cost involved in terms of uh, uh, keeping your site active, in terms of your site security, uh, in terms of administration. So you have to check with your accounting departments and indirect costs. So here in this particular scenario, the indirect costs uh, are indicated for 12 weeks period, it is 1,000. 1, for 11 weeks, it's 925. So the lower the period, the lower the indirect costs. So uh, while to computing the total cost, it's very important to take into account not only the direct costs as given by the contractors, but also to take into account the indirect costs uh, for managing your overall project and the site. So here you see if we decide to deliver this project in the 12 weeks duration, uh, a summation of direct and indirect costs will be 2,000. Uh, if we decide to deliver it in 11 weeks period, the summation will be 1975 and if you decide to do it in a, a, a 10 period so i think it will be 1970 so here you can see not a very remarkable difference between week 10 and week 11 so it will make a lot of sense to do it take that week 10 option and as you go to week 9 uh, the summation will be and the cost tend to go slightly high 19 uh, 85 and uh, in week eight so from a client's perspective i think uh, the best option is uh, keeping in view both the time and cost dimension is not to deliver in eight weeks because that could be a very expensive option but perhaps delivering in a 10 week period is giving an uh, overall better cost profile than delivering the project in two weeks. So you are saving the money and you're also saving in terms of a two critical uh, uh, weeks from your project. So we uh, tend to draw these uh, time cost and uh, trade-off graphs where you tend to take into account the direct costs uh, and uh, you take into account your uh, the indirect costs. So the direct costs, uh, increases usually when you try to squeeze the duration of the project so you have got crash whereas the indirect costs uh, are reduced because you are delivering the project in a shorter period of time so you can calculate the total project cost which gives you the best profile so in our example which we just saw uh, the and uh, delivering the project in uh, week uh, week 10 has given us the best profile which uh, should be our recommendation uh, to the uh, client. So here you can see the optimum cost time point and um, by taking into account both the direct cost and in the uh, indirect cost. So uh, some uh, uh, room for uh, reflection here. This uh, problem, it talks about a uh, dam construction where certain activities have been delayed and you are uh, encouraged to think about when uh, is the ideal time for this project to uh, commence. Okay, so I think this is uh, some of the a good reading list to support this uh, session. Uh, I think uh, I've spoken a lot, so I will uh, bring my uh, session to uh, uh, close at this point.